Okay, then I have to tell a little bit more how it works. You have an application. And you choose some restaurant, you choose some meal, you click on it, you slide to confirm, and then magic happens. In 30 to 40 minutes, your food magically arrives. Did you ever use Vault for food ordering? Did you ever order food using Vault? Okay, just sit and listen. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not that rude. <laughs> yeah, so your lunch will magically arrive under your door. And what happens internally? Some unicorns start jumping over our servers and try to find the best way to deliver your food. So they have to analyze a lot of data, like where are the courier partners? How do they move? What are their possible routes? Where are the restaurants? Where are the customers? What is the list of the orders? A lot of information. And we have to find the best one. I'm not going to define the best one. It's a company secret. <laughs> yeah, sorry for that. But as I mentioned, we are thinking on routes, on movement through the cities. And uh, when you move to the city, you actually use road graph. Or speaking more simple, you use map. And we in turn use OpenStreetMap. So my talk will be half OpenStreetMap and half Spark. So for those who came for just Spark, short introduction to short introduction to OpenStreetMap. OpenStreetMap is something like Wikipedia in worlds of maps. It's not Wikimapia, because Wikimapia is a collection of labels like this is a table, and this is a public toilet, and this is a castle, and this is a secret nuclear war base or something like that, you can't use it. But OpenStreetMap is completely different. It's a collection, it's a database of all the features on the planet Earth, somehow connected to the Earth, so can be below the Earth. I'm, I'm dreaming that I will live long enough for somebody to start open insert your planet here map, but right now it's just OpenStreetMap. And the problem is, the Earth is big. I traveled here from Helsinki, and it takes maybe six or seven hours to fly to Prague and then take a train. So that, and it's just in Europe, it's like this one distance. But the Earth is huge, and therefore database of the features on the planet is huge. So right now, I checked it last week. The database of Open State Map was roughly 1 and 2, 1.2 terabytes. And it sounds like a good case for Apache Spark to analyze it. So for those who came for OpenStreetMap, now your time to learn what is Apache Spark. Official definition is very nice. An open source distributed general purpose cluster computing framework. Amazing pile of buzzwords. But what it does? What it does? What, why do we need that stuff? The idea of Spark is simple. What if you have some big data set and you would like to do some stuff in your data set. But unfortunately, your data set is too big. And you can't load it on your laptop. And you can't load it into the RAM of your laptop. And you can't even lay it down on the drive of your laptop. And you can't even go to Amazon and order a host big enough for it. Problem. You can't analyze a data frame, but not with Spark. With Spark, you can partition your data frame. You can partition your data set and lay out the parts of your data set on several nodes. So making your compute cluster virtually endless, you can attach as many nodes as you have. You can have as many RAM, as many CPU cores as you can pay for Amazon, for example. But it's not that expensive, as you think. And that means you can keep all of your data right in RAM. And you can process it right in RAM. And you can process huge data, data sets, right in RAM. You can do it without Spark, but you can do it right now. And Planet is big. So what we can do? We have not too much options. The first one option, the simplest one. You take OSM data and import it 
Oh, I'm already on that slide. Oh, I need to start, I need to insert a couple of jokes right here, here right now. <laughs> yeah, so you take your OSM data and you import it into a PostGIS database or Osmosis database using pretty f existing tools. And then you can exit that data. <coughs> I'm sorry, give me a second. And then you can exit that data right from the Spark using JDBC connector. As simple as possible. The good part, everything is already here. There is a converter for OSM data. There is a database for it. There is a JDBC connector. Everything is right here. And as you are using the real database like Postgres, you can use whatever, you can, you can import into Mongo, you can import into Elasticsearch if you're crazy enough. But still, it's, it's a real database. You can make a query and tell like, dear Spark, could you please load some geometry from the database limited by that boundary? Or could you please load some geometry in 100 kilometers from that point? Or could you please all the geometry with some tag? So, and database will happily filter it for you. Problem solved, the talk is over, I'm going down, oh no, 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 sorry. The problem is you have to maintain all that crap. You have to install your database. And you have to keep your database in sync with OpenStreetMap. And just loading OSM data in Postgres usually takes several hours. Every time the planet is updated, the planet is updated on Saturday, you spend several hours. And you need several terabytes, like two to 2.5 terabytes of disk space for Postgres database, depending on the, your schema and the indices. So slow ineffective, but, but working. Another one option, that, that was the, the second option I tried. Okay, there are some tools for Spark like Magellan or GeoSpark, and they are able to read a predefined formats like well-known binary format, well-known text format, uh, GeoJSON, they can read shape files, whatever. And you obviously can convert your OSM data into that some kind of a format, doesn't matter and load it directly on Spark. The problem, uh, well, the good part, okay, everything's still here. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. The problem, it's even slower. And in worst case, you have to import it into Postgres database and then export it from it. So it's like number one, but slower and harder. And no filtering on load, because you're just reading the text files, not any kind of stuff. And the third approach, what if, you will try to load your OSM database directly into Spark. Probably you will not need to convert it, so you're saving time here. Um, probably you may try to filter it on load, at least on um, entities, or on tags, or something like that, but no one did it. That was the main problem. No one did it, so I had to start working on that issue. And uh, when I started working on that, I realized that there is a problem doing that. The problem is the OSM data itself. When I say OSM database, OpenStreetMap database, it's not a real database. Most of the time when you have OpenStreetMap data, it's just a huge file, just a file on your disk, plain one. And this file consists of three types of entities. The first one, let me try it. Yes, it works. The node. The node have coordinates, latitude, longitude, and ID. ID is not important right now, but the coordinates are important because the node is a single OSM entity that have a geometry. The second is a way, and the way is defined as a sequence of nodes. But if you think of a sequence like in a programming language, so you touch the way and it explodes and contains nodes and you can reconstruct geometry from the way, no, you can't. Because way is just an array of node identifiers. So if you, if you have a way, define it like one, two, five, you have to go to your list of nodes and find nodes one to five and extract geometry from them and propagate it back to the way. probably you started to understand what the problem is, but 
Even more, we have relation. And the relation is a collection of ways, nodes, and other relations. So you may have relation error. And relations use identifiers to refer to other objects. So if you have a complex relation of several polygon polygons, and you use, usually we use relations for everything else, like polygons, multipoints, multipolygons, whatever you have. Just, to, just make it a relation. If you can't make it a note away, make it a relation. But if you have that relation, if you have that relation, you have to go back to other relations. You have to go back to other ways. You have to go back to the nodes. And finally, you will be able to reconstruct your geometry. And your file is one, well, it's compressed, so it's roughly 50 gigabytes. But internally, it's 1.2 terabytes of data. And you can't fit it in RAM. And because of that, there is a convention, convention that usually nodes are stored in front of ways and the ways are stored in front of relations. So if you read that file sequentially, when you hit the first way, you probably seen all the nodes, and probably you cache them somehow, or process them somehow, or at least indices. it. Well, at least you have a chance to reconstruct the geometry of the way. Same, relies, uh, same applies to relations, except relations hierarchy. Because relation may refer to another one relation. And this one can be before this, the, the original one or after. You don't know. You never know. It's not a big problem with the hierarchy. But the biggest problem is that sequential access to the file. You have to read it in order. And as you have to read it in order, and when I hear you have to do something in order, it means single threaded processing, just a single process. Now imagine you have a Spark cluster of 12, 12 nodes, 10 cores each, 112, 120 cores. Doing what? Waiting for a single core reading 1.2 terabytes of data. I hate it. That's a waste of resource, and it spends a lot of time. But with Spark, wait a minute. Spark, we can keep all our data set, the whole planet, in memory. That means we don't need to read it sequentially. We can just read it like starting from this one, from this one, from this one. We can read it randomly, put it into RAM, and then process. And the solution number one is a parallel PBF reader. The PBF is a one of the transport format of uh, OpenStreetMap. And yes, PBF stands for protocol buffers from by Google. But PBF is not just a parallel protocol buffer file. Uh, it's actually meta structure over it. And it consists of several blobs uh, in a protocol buffer format. You can Google, or uh, you can find it on an OSM wiki. It's out of scope, my current talk. But the good thing, I have a reader written in Java 8, so you can use it in uh, your legacy applications and even Spark. It's available on a GitHub under JPLv3. It's available on Myron Central. And the API is quite simple. Well, actually, that's all the API of the reader. You can do much more. You just specify callbacks. Like if you see a node, call this function. If you see a way, call this function. If you see bounding box, call this function. If you, if you don't need ways, for example, don't specify a callback, and they will be automatically skipped. So it will be even faster. There are just two parameters. The input, and input is input stream, so it doesn't matter. It shouldn't be a file. Any kind of input stream. We don't care. And number of threads. Probably it should be something like number of your cores or doubled number of your cores. I checked both, no, no difference. They are mostly limited by underlying storage. So we have that wonderful guy. Is it fast? Oh, yeah. I was thinking, like, how to verify it, how, what to do to compare. And then I thought, OK, let's do some really synthetic test. Count all the entities with a fixed mid tag for different type of entities. You can easily do it sequentially. You can do it in parallel. doesn't matter. On the left side, Osmosis Library Single Threaded Reader, written in Scala. Oh, sorry, written in Java. On the right side, wonderful parallel Java Reader. Same host. Amazon C59 instance, 36 cores, and local NVMe SSD attached. So we are not 
the measurements are not um, influenced by Amazon's infrastructure, it's local, local disk. For small things like for Czech Republic, 34 seconds, single thread at 11 seconds, multi multiple threads, not interesting. It's just 20 seconds. But if you would like to read the whole planet, it will be 45 minutes for the planet reading in one thread and a little bit less than 15 minutes with 36 thread. And yeah, more threads, faster reading. If you can buy order 72 cores, it will be even faster. 30 minutes of your life. Sounds good. It works faster. Now, let's try to drop that beast into Spark. Oh no, not again. We have another one problem. Yeah, we can drop parallel PBF right into Spark and load it into some in-memory structure, say, array. And then convert that array into data frame. But it means that just a single host of our Spark cluster will be processing data file, OSM file. And it means we have to first load all the data into our RAM. But if it can fit our RAM, then why we need Spark at all? And even if we are crazy enough and stupid and load and buy a big host, collection of big host, cluster of big host, and each host can fit into a RAM, and for some reason we do that, and then we create data frame, the Spark will happily start distributing and shuffling the data frame and copying from that single host to other host for no reason, actually. Sounds crazy, like why? Why, why are you doing that? That, that? That's not the thing what you do. What I would like to do, what I would like to have is that all my hosts in my cluster, all the executors are reading the same file in parallel and reading their own part of that file and keeping it in local RAM, not shuffling it between the host, not waiting for somebody else, just reading it all the time in parallel. So I had to write a new thing, Spark Awesome Data Source. It's a native Spark data source. And it's built on top of Parallel PBF. It's compiled for Scala 2.11 and 2.12. It will be compiled for 2.13 when Spark will support 2.13. Not yet. Even 2.12 not supported very good right now. So 2.11 is a safer way. Yes, it's available under GPLv3. GitHub, Maven, you can go and try it. The, the difference between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 is just the number of packages, so I moved it from my local repository to a worldwide repository. <laughs> Not too much. Uh, it supports partitioning. The, the, the main, that was the main goal, it supports partitioning. So right now you just tell, dear Spark, could you please load that map file? And all the nodes will start loading your file and keeping their part of data locally. And regarding partitioning, I was thinking like, should I do that or not? Uh, you have to specify it. Yeah, I will show it on the next slide probably. Uh, another one thing that it supports, and it is really interesting, with Spark you can ask Spark to distribute your file before starting your stages. And if you would like to reread your file several times, and it may happen if you have too many partition, partitions, for example, uh, it saves times on refetching it from remote storage like S3 or HTTP. So, the best part. When I was thinking on that slide, I was just thinking that I should stay, yeah, by remote viewers, that I should stay right here and close this. The same test, exactly the same test. Let's calculate, let's calculate all the fix me tags on different types of entities, how much it takes. It takes us two and a half minutes for the whole planet. Right here, we started with 45, 45 minutes. Same result, two and a half. 20 times faster, it worth it. But probably you will think like, okay, 20 times faster, but of course it's 20 times faster. You have 12, oh sorry, you have 20 nodes. It should be pretty expensive, no. Yeah, each of those nodes is pretty expensive on Amazon. And if you start that cluster for several hours, uh, you'd better not do that. 
I, I think it will cost like maybe 60, 600 euros just for one hour of running that cluster. But for two minutes it will, three euros, seven. If I remember correctly, I paid seven euros for this one run. You can afford it. Not too much. Okay, so how to use it? The, it's simple, it's pretty simple. So it's normal Spark data source. So you set options and you send the file. The only thing I was concerned is the partition. You have to specify partitions manually. And there were several options for that and I was thinking and the initial version was a little bit different. You, you may try to estimate your file and estimate the size of your cluster and try to automatically partition it. Like if I have 10 nodes and in total one terabyte, so probably I must have 20 partitions probably or 10, I have no idea, depends on the file. Or the second option was like just hard code some number. Like you know, Spark have predefined number of 200 partitions by default. So okay, let it be 200. And then I realized, okay, why it, be, why it should be my problem? Let it be a problem of data engineer who starts that log and that guy knows, that data engineer knows like how much data I have, how big is my cluster, how much RAM I have, and how many executors and cores and stuff. So let's just customer and your user specify how many partitions you have. You also have to specify how many threads parallel PDF should be using. So that's technically a number of cores per executor. And that's all. Just go and start using it. And it's Spark, and it's built on Spark. You can use any source of files, so S3, HDFS, local files, and you can use local, uh, where is it, yeah. Use local file option to make it compatible with Spark at file feature. So just go and use it. But, no, but is the next slide. That data source schema. I forgot about this one, sorry. That's really a non-interesting slide. Uh, the data source schema is almost the same as the API schema of OSM. I was thinking like, should I split it into, sorry, give me, sorry one more time. I was thinking like, mm, should I split it into several data frames, like one for nodes, one for relations, and one for ways, or should I keep it together? And I thought, okay, I'm working with OSM data, I'm not working with geometry data here. So let it be like OSM. And it contains like common part, like ID, tag, and info, and type. And ID is an OSM object, and type is an OSM entity type, and tags and info are OSM tags and info, like who created that object that changed that ID, and so on. And variable part like geometry, way definition, and relation definition. So if you have a way, it will the only way column will be filled, and all the other columns will be null. And for example, for node, only long longitude latitude columns will be filled, and other variable columns will be null. The good thing is that if you don't need some, and you say you drop way, it will be skipped. So it will not be, it will not even try to load the way. It's smart enough to understand that. But filtering is really, really based here. And geometry is not reconstructed. So you are reading just OSM data. It's not geometry, it's pure OSM data. And because it's pure OSM data, it's hard to work with it. Well, it depends on what, what you like to do. If you are going to just analyze some text, you finished the photo, right? Okay, so if you're going to just analyze some text, oh, sorry. You can work like right with that stretch di directly. So you filter on text and analyze it. You don't need to anything else. But if you would like to do some more interesting stuff, I realized I need a lot of hand helpers. So another one, third library. Just a set of helpers to help you process OSM data. Different license. Right now it's Apache 2.0. I would like to make everything like Apache or mid license, but for PBF, I'm relying on a cross by PBF driver, so it's under GPL and everything else is under GPL, but this one is completely independent thing. Same Scala, same availability on GitHub, 
unfortunately not on a Maven central yet because it's work in progress. It's not even half baked, it's unbaked completely. And probably it's not even a pastry yet. <laughs> there are some simple procedures. Like you can merge two, two data sets and exclude uh, duplicates. Uh, you can limit or extract by some boundary, like VBOX or more complex polygon boundary. Uh, you can try to work with a relation hierarchy protection, like find kids of that relation or find parent of that relation or find kids of all my parents and so on and so on. Um, conversion from base to geometry, if you would like to work on geometry, conversion of multi-polygon relations to geometry, but it's really, really basic right now. It doesn't support proper ordering, that ordering of polygons, and sometimes it fails. Yes, yeah, sorry, it's work in progress. Uh, you can export it to a smoothest format database. Not really useful thing. I'm mostly using it for debugging, and the funny part, the renderer written in Spark query language. Yes, I'm rendering maps from, right from Spark. Um, one more thing that Spark allowed to do is extraction. Uh, the extraction of OSM data is a typical problem. You have the whole planet, but you would like to work on, say, Brno. You have to extract just the Brno by polygon. Uh, typically, all the tools have just three well, options. So the problem is that nodes. If you would like to extract some data by geometry, you have to extract by geometry. And geometry is just in a node. So first you limit your data set to the nodes. But then you have to find your ways and relations. So the simplest way is that you filter on nodes. OK, now you know which nodes are included. Are included. And then you just filter the ways, uh, sorry, that you include the ways that match those nodes. But those ways will be incomplete. You see, for example, that green one, it goes outside of the box. But with a simple approach, OK, you have just a part of it. So you have problem analyzing it. And a lot of tools, say Osmium tool, provides you with complete ways and relation. So when you read file second time, you know, OK, I included those ways. I included those relations. I need to read those points and make it complete complete ways. Oh, same four relations, but just two times. But now, we have relations in RAM. Yeah. Now we can build a hierarchy of relations. Oh, yeah, thank you. Not the best way <laughs> to close the door, but still. You have all, all, all the stuff in your RAM. So you can complete reference in your relations. You can fill your relations with the Children relations, of your relations. That the thing that completely out of the box, but your data will be reference complete. And another one option, you can build, I, I don't have a picture for a fifth option. I tried to draw it and it looks pretty bad. But you can try to find parents of included relations that are not even referenced by stuff inside of your area of interest <laughs> and include them. For example, if I will be, finding parents for Brno, it will include South Moravia region boundary, Czech Republic boundary, European Union boundary, all the boundaries of other European Union countries, and so on. So it's pretty big definition of extraction by area, but still technically you can do it. Complete user stuff, by the way. Most of it was written just for fun, don't worry. And the fun part. Fun part comes, he comes here. Like, let's try to do something useful. Let's try to calculate the public transport coverage. How do I define it? Take all the residential buildings, take all the public transport platforms, and find the distance to the nearest one. And I don't like tables, so let's colorize the buildings. Some boring part comes here, the code. First of all, load the data. I'm loading the Czech Republic extract provided by Geofabric. The second one thing, the thing that you should never be doing, I'm extracting a single row of the whole data frame. 
And if you came from an OSM part with a Spark, you don't have indices. So if you would like to extract a single row, you have to visit all the rows, unfortunately. But that was the simplest way here, just for example. Usually you don't need it. You, you can define your polygon somehow, but I'm just finding the official border of Brno with some reference provided by Czech government. Locations. It's just a simple Spark query. You filter on values. Nothing to do. You work in Spark. For, forget your OSM. You are now in a safe Spark land. Get some geometry and uh, Czech government have a very nice thing called Ruyan. And ev almost every building in OSM have Ruyan type, so you can easily filter on residential buildings. And interesting part, now you have ways definition and you can convert ways to geometry. Now when you have geometry, the analysis. Analysis is really, really simple. It's not OSM related and it's not even Spark. It's like Spark for kids level. Just find the, not even mean point of a building polygon, but mean point of a bounding box of building polygon, but it's good enough for us. Uh, find distances. And uh, there are a lot of magic happens here, distance to render parameters, but I'm not publishing that function. You can find it on Google. Oh, sorry, you can find it on a GitHub, because m the most of that function is just conversion from distance to RGB space. <laughs> it's not that interesting. Set parameters like minimal zoom will be 13. Render with polygon symbolizer and send it to render pipeline. And it will send it to some local file. The result will be like this. No, no, no. The my part is just that green and blue buildings. The underlying part is OpenStreetMap data from OpenStreetMap site. It's tip, it's Carto map. Uh, you see that Brno have a quite great situation with public transport. Everything is green here. Like the close up of area of university. The university should be somewhere here, I think. You see green and blue. The green means it's less than 100 meters to nearest public transport stop, and blue is, it's, it's going from blue to red with a step of 100 meters, if I remember correctly. So you can easily analyze it. And as I'm rendering just the polygons, you see it overlaps with the roads. <laughs> but yeah, this, this might be rendered with Spark. And for example, if I will be doing the real analysis of uh, public transportation, I will be able to easily spot the problematic area it's in Orzhashin. Those guys have to walk like two to two, two point half kilometers to nearest public transport stop. And yes, everything is done with the stuff I just showed to you. But the stuff is not yet finished. So the first thing that I plan to do is the writing support for parallel PDF. It will produce unordered files, because I will be writing in parallel threads, so it may happen that ways will be in front of, well, in front of anything. Other ways, no relations, I have no idea. Uh, but as I can read it back into memory, it's not a big deal. And it's thick tightened out. I had seven hours traveling from Helsinki to Brno, so I wrote half of that stuff. And maybe on my road back, I will finish it and publish it. So it's striking out. Uh, for Spark OSM data source, I need to finally implement pushing down the Spark filters right to the data source for text. So you will not be reading the stuff you don't need. And probably geometry conversion on load, but I'm still thinking like, should I do it on load or not? Because if you don't need a geometry, it will just slow down the loading and processing. I'm still thinking on that. You can just leave me a note if you, if you have some opinion on that issue. And for Spark Awesome Tools, it needs to be more useful. So relations needs to be solved properly. And uh, hierarchy should be supported by GraphX. Because everyone uses GraphX for nodes, and I'm using just a table. Uh, geometry definitely should be there. Like, if you need to find some geometry and convert it, OK, just you, have, you, you need to have a function to convert from geometry to OSM and back. And if you will have a geometry, probably I have to convert to say, well-known binary. So GeoSpark and Magellan will be able to interoperate with that stuff, and vice versa. So long-standing plans, probably I will finish some of them. 
probably know, I don't know. Uh, here are some beautiful links. Go to GitHub and see all the source code. All the examples and all the renders that I mentioned, they are on GitHub, on different repos, but you can go and take a look on them. Uh, you can write me a mail if you like, you can visit my GitHub, and obviously you can... <coughs> I will wait for everyone to finish their photos, it's okay, don't worry. And probably you should go and order your, order your lunch today at Vault. And uh, thank you. Now it's time for your questions. Yeah, sure, go on. I think it's doable, but I haven't tried yet. But that's a great idea. Um, I have a question for you. So the question was like, uh, we have uh, obviously parent-children relation between uh, nodes, ways, and relations. And uh, Spark is good in representing graph. And can we represent in graph? And my answer was, no, I haven't tried it yet, but it should be doable. But I have now a question for you. What would be the use case? Think about the use case, uh, but uh, you know we build some uh, library that is processing uh, <coughs> data, and uh, maybe uh, if you convert the data into a graph uh, representation, uh, you uh, cannot uh, should not build the, the library. I don't know. Yeah, uh, and the answer was like, okay, it, you you should try it and see how it goes. In just two words. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. cutting your uh, long answer. Maybe, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Bro, it, it, I think it's worth trying it. The, the background of that of that project is uh, mostly for fun. Because if if if, if um, in, in real life you would like to render stuff, just go grab Mapnik, compile it, and render it. If you would like to extract some data, just go to for Osmium and extract it. But this one is mostly for fun and. Uh, the single use case, if you need to make some ad hoc analysis of some data, you don't want to install all that stuff. You don't want to configure your PostGIS and import it. You can just go, load it, calculate quickly, and drop it. Yeah? Okay, so the question was, uh, I mentioned that the data set consists of nodes, bunch of nodes, bunch of ways, bunch of relations. But I mentioned that I'm reading the, them in parallel matter, and I'm reading them partition it, uh, partition it way on a several host at the same time. So how do I do that? That's a good question. Uh, this one thing, parallel PDF, has one, another one parameter. It's documented, but it's not supposed to be used, well, used with caution. You can specify a number of partitions and your slice number. So the binary format of OSMPBF consists of several blocks, and each block contains roughly 16 megabytes of data, up to 16 megabytes of data. If you have more data, you go to next, you start writing the next block. Each block may contain just a single type of entity. So the, the single block may contain just nodes, ways, relations, or change sets. They, they are not covered here, because no, no one uses probably them. <laughs> so what I'm doing? I know which block is assigned to each partition. So if you have partition number one and in 10 partitions, so blocks number one, 11, 21, what will be 31, and so on, and so on, are yours. 
same for second partition, so 2, 12, 22, and so on. And while you read the file, you know the sizes of those blobs. So you read the blob, say, number 1, and then you skip 10 next until you hit your next one. If you are reading your data from HTTP or S3, of course, that, that will be a problem because you have to receive it. But if you are reading it from local file and S3 is smart enough to not to send the whole data, it will skip it automatically with, with the S3A driver or S3N, I don't remember. They have two drivers, all the new, then the new one knows how to skip stuff. Uh, it will skip automatically to the next one. If you are reading from HTTP, yeah, it will be received. That, that's how it implements internally. We have 10 more minutes for questions if somebody is brave. So if I understand correctly, uh, you are running Spark on the Amazon Web Services? Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you try a database for the Spark uh, The honest answer will be, I googled where can I run Spark cluster cheap, and the Amazon was the first answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe I should try Databricks. So, probably that's all. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Try and stop. <laughs>